I now look to Professor Donna Dickinson to close the case for the opposition. Mr. President, distinguished guests, honorable members, this is quite a weighty responsibility that falls on my shoulders. And I want to, at the very beginning to say that I am not one of those ethicists who favors every new technology. There are such ethicists, and I am emphatically not one of them. That is why I firmly believe that it would be a mistake for this House to take the view, to espouse the view, that it believes genetic engineering undermines the nature of humanity, because I think he would be playing into the hands of those very people. You were asked your opinion of whether genetic engineering undermines the nature of humanity. You are not being asked your opinion of genetic engineering, is it good or bad? But most of the discussion tonight has focused on exactly that. And the problem with that is that we have spent the entire evening asking the wrong question. Whether the nature of humanity is good or bad is the wrong question. Because one might very well argue that there is no such thing as the nature of humanity. And I think it would be entirely plausible to do so, that one could view humanity, humanity's nature as changing across cultures, as changing across historical periods, as not determined in any sense, certainly not by our genes. And one of my colleagues, the second speaker, has already mentioned that if there were such a thing as the nature of humanity, it would include early maternal death, early infant death, and that it would not necessarily be good or bad. But what I really want to get across here is that it is wrong, I think, for the proposition to assume that the opposition is all motivated by pro-scientific, blindly pro-scientific attitudes. About 10 years ago, I brought out a book called Body Shopping. Good title, huh? <laughs> and this was a critique of the commodification of eggs and of other forms of reproductive technology. I was given some 50 or 60 interviews. It really took off. And everyone began, are you just a Luddite? And to which I always said, no. <laughs> that is the assumption that anyone who writes even a, fa uh, a fairly balanced, as I thought it was, critique of new developments is a Luddite. Now, the people who do espouse new developments, in my view, uncritically, are very prone to seize on concepts such as the nature of humanity and say that's woolly thinking. And they have a point. That is, that is the sort of weak and flimsy argument which does not help the proposition's case. And I am actually very sympathetic to the proposition's case in very many ways. But the nature of humanity is what philosophers, such as myself, I'm a philosopher and lawyer, call an instance of the naturalistic fallacy. That is, simply because something is does not mean it is either good or bad. If you've read your Hume, you know that. <laughs> and I'm sure you've all read your Hume. So, <laughs> so what I want to say is that the topics that we should have been discussing this evening have some of them been discussed, the ones that are more to do with medical matters. And those, in my view, would include things like the balance of medical risks to medical benefits, the question of whether the benefits occur in this generation or subsequent ones, the distinction between somatic and germline ther therapy. These are all extremely important, but there are also a number of other issues which we have not yet raised and which I want to bring out, which I think are the real concerns which are masked and camouflaged by an over-concentration on the unhelpful concept of the nature of humanity. First, the legal position. I did say I was a lawyer. <laughs> Some 39 states have actually voted to prohibit germline gen genetic engineering or to substantially hedge it about with restrictions. The only exception, actually, is the UK. And the UK, by passing the 2015 legislation in favor of mitochondrial germline modification, which is a slightly different technology, has allowed a certain amount of germline modification. But, how, but there are international conventions, such as the UNESCO Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights, that is the Oviedo Convention as well, which forbid germline genetic engineering. Why do they do this? Well, it might seem to be a good thing, eradicating harmful genomes, for, uh, genetic variants rather, alleles, forever. 
and it might be that to save lives is the ethical thing to do. That seems obvious in some ways. But germline gene editing does not actually save existing lives. Instead, it would save affected individuals from being born. That's a different matter. The risks I've already mentioned do not necessarily, therefore, outweigh the benefits. But what we are looking at throughout, I think, are political questions. And I am suggesting that the concept of the nature of humanity is not a politically useful um, concept to use. Instead, I think we need to be looking at such political questions as who decides on the risks? Who decides whether future generations will have the right to an open future? Which was mentioned by one of the speakers from the floor and was also a major concern in the, 2018, the March 2018 report of the Royal Society just published in which focus groups around the UK said how concerned they were by the right of the child to an open future. So it's not simply uh, some sort of pedantic or academic concept. It's actually a popular concern as well. And they wanted to see all alternative options explored, things like PGD, before going down the germline genetic engineering route. Here's another thing I'm concerned about, slippery slopes. So gene editing might well, in the first instance, be targeted on disease particularly somatic gene editing, and I think there are fewer problems with that. But there could be pressure, and those pressures have been brought out by the speakers from the floor particularly, for a sort of bastardized form of eugenics. That is, a eugenics created not by deliberate government policy, but by free market choices to, for individuals to use these new technologies. Now, enhancement in particular is perhaps open to that, this, again, is not simply an academic concern, and it's not just bandying words. There has been substantial commercial interest in CRISPR gene editing in particular, and that is partly because it is a very cheap technology. So you don't really need a very expensive lab to do it. And therefore, it will be, it will be popular. Many entrants are likely to enter the field. There has, in fact, already been an example of commercialization in genetic engineering, and that was the commercial firm Darwin Life, an American firm founded in 2016, which was founded to combine gene editing with mitochondrial replacement, that is three-parent IVF. Now, the firm was banned in 2016 by the US FDA, but it's an instance, I think, of how far down that slippery slope we've already gone. If you think of the parallel with cosmetic surgery, cosmetic surgery originally had a firm scientific and humanitarian basis. That is, the purpose was to help people to recover who'd been injured in war. But cosmetic surgery, of course, as we all know, has now burgeoned into a huge megabucks industry. There is, I think, a risk that that could also happen, but it is not a risk that we've discussed tonight. We haven't really looked at commercialization in any detail because we've been fixated on the nature of humanity. Not a good idea. And then finally, distributive justice has not really been addressed tonight. So, for example, there's been a re recent beta thalassemia trial, gene editing trial, which has been quite successful. And this has been used, uh, can be potentially used, in other forms of blood-related diseases, such as sickle cell disease. Where does most sickle cell disease occur? In the third world. Is it going to be affordable by third world governments? Probably not. And probably the same goes for the beta thalassemia case. So we really need to ask questions about how these techniques are going to be funded, what would justice consist in, will there be gene rich and gene poor? And it seems to me that the nature of humanity is a red herring that diverts us from these important questions, which are mainly social, economic, and political, such as the ones that I've just delineated, particularly the commercialization aspect. So there are indeed very solid reasons for the proposition's view, and I think they have come out well tonight, and I congratulate the proposition on presenting them extremely well, in my view. I do think that these very solid reasons, however, are not captured by the idea of the nature of humanity, and indeed, I think it is counterproductive for those who have concerns, as I do, and many of you do, about whether these technologies should or should not be allowed, and that is a different set of issues. 
It might even be that if this union, which has quite a track record of having been noticed in the news over the last 70 or 80 years, were to put forward a motion saying it believes genetic engineering undermines the nature of humanity, that would open you up, and this is your decision, not mine, but my advice, <laughs> for what it's worth, is that it would open you up to criticisms of being Luddites, of being perhaps God-botherers, what a terrible thing, or of being soft in your reasoning, and that would also be a terrible thing. <laughs> so I think it is very important that you use the right arguments, and I think the whole purpose of this evening is to help us delineate the right arguments. The nature of humanity, in my view, is not one of the right arguments. It's one of the wrong arguments. Indeed, I think it's a dangerous distraction from the real issues, such as commercial interests, the consent of future generations, justice, and the precautionary principle that has led so many countries to ban gene editing. It's an easy argument, it's a straw man, for opponents, for your opponents, to knock down. Please don't give them that chance. Vote to oppose the motion. <laughs>